with this, uh, we're going to uh, uh, get started. So uh, Michael Gorner, unfortunately, uh, cannot be with us. So uh, Michael, being from California, uh, uh, I don't know whether he does science, but he makes movies. So <laughs> this, is, uh, this, is, uh, this is the next best thing we can have. So we're going to have a movie. Uh, this movie is about uh, 83 minutes long, so just pace yourself. And it's going to be on the firebrands. And uh, uh, we are very sorry that Michael cannot be uh, uh, in person here, and he's very sorry himself. But uh, uh, that's the be next best thing we could do. So I'm going to uh, play the movie. Uh, we have the volume set up at a certain level. If some of you think that it should be higher or lower, just let me know. We can adjust that. Hi, my name is Michael Goldner, and I'm a faculty here at the University of California, Berkeley. I'm happy to be here to talk with you today about Firebrand, or we we'll discuss uh, colloquially known also as Embers. So I'm very excited. This uh, University of Maryland Summer School on Fire Safety Science, Wildland and Woolly Behavior is finally taking off. Uh, it was a long process and uh, very thankful for our no and others for carrying this through and making this happen. I'm really sad I can't be here today, but I hope that the information that I share with you all is useful as you gain knowledge on wildland and wooey fires, which firebrands or embers play an incredibly important role, especially in structured destruction. So if you have any questions with this in this uh, uh, video and the information shared, please feel free to email me, mgolner at berkeley.edu. I'd be happy to take your uh, questions and share any information um, from that. So without further ado, let's get to the elephant in the room, which is what is a firebrand versus an ember? They're often used interchangeably, and I'm thankful for Vito Borowskis, who many of you know from his ignition handbook and work on the cone calorimeter, who helped to define these two terms. Um, and so, as, as he wrote, basically, an ember refers to any small part combinationist particle. And so, in other words, you know, your coals and as well as our firebrand and wildfires are embers. However, a firebrand specifically is one of these objects, flaming or smoldering, that is carried for a distance in an airstream, which means that aerodynamic properties play a role too. And so that characteristic also needs to be considered. And so now we're talking about something that both has some energy and is reacting as well as being transported. And so firebrands being transported can be called flying brands or brands. Sometimes you hear sparks, but that's really more towards metal. Uh, but they can be burning. Firebrands are almost always classified when they're burning, either flaming in the gas phase or smoldering with solid phase oxidation. And of course, we're interested in them because they serve as an ignition source for vegetation, structures, and other fuels. And so we don't often see one firebrand. We see lots of them. So we see storms, blizzards, a rain, a shower of embers or firebrands uh, to denote this process. And so just note that terminology. We're going to talk about them, and you'll see that I'll even slip off and use ember and firebrand somewhat interchangeably. But, you know, it's sort of the same thing when it's landed, but we're really talking about these particles that are transported and can ignite and cause new fires. So this is an example, right? Uh, Stuart Pally is a, a photographer. He has some books which are, are wonderful here in California, uh, and he goes out to a lot of these wildland fires and documents them. And so I encourage you to check out his website, but this, this, this long uh, exposure is just fabulous looking at the firebrands that are flying off this uh, residual burning vegetation. And sure enough, as we start to learn more, we see that firebrands are often generated after the flaming front is through and the smoldering particles and it degrades and starts flying off, producing the firebrands, which are transporting and causing new fires. So... Why are these important? Well, there's, there's two situations we usually see. First is in wildland fires. And so wildland fire is all-encompassing. It's forest, grassland, shrubland, bush fire, uh, but through vegetation. And so uh, this graphic sort of well depicts it. You have a uh, fire crew trying to keep the fire from crossing a line, and the burning firebrands cross the line, create spot fires, which is a new ignition, and they work with hand tools or with a tanker, and they try to put out those spot fires. That's a very common practice, even done on 
structures, but typically spot fire denotes a new fire on vegetation. This is a video taken from, uh, I believe it was in Australia, and you can just see a series of spot fires of what an extreme case might look like under high wind, whether it's set intentionally or not, right? There are lots of small elliptical spreads resulting from an initial start. Now, we'll talk about Wuli in just a second, but a fire into an urban or semi-urban area is also going to be critical when it comes to firebrands or spot fires. But now the generation of those firebrands is not only uh, a function where we're, we're concerned about the generation of those brands starting this uh, fire and vegetation, but also into the structural materials itself or into vegetation, which spreads to the structure. So therefore, we have to be cognizant of, of all these processes, the generation from vegetation, generation from structural materials, and how they spread. And you can see how devastating this can be. All pictures here are from the campfire, uh, just from AFP Getty News. And you can basically see how devastating the evacuation was from the campfire, which resulted in over 80 losses of life. So what is the Wildland Urban Interface or WUI? We can't get any further without addressing it. You've heard it before, but this is basically where structures, human development, or whatever that may be, meet or intermingle with undeveloped wildland or vegetation fruits. So structure is next to vegetation. That's the true interface. But it can also be completely intermixed. The Marshall Fire in Colorado is completely intermixed, grass lots spreading, and it can be both from fire spread as well as ember spotting or mixes of all of the above. Uh, and how do you pronounce it? <laughs> I'll use that. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's not the perfect term. This is from Stephen Pine. And if you haven't seen his work, he's got a number of excellent uh, books on wildland fire. But essentially, right, it's not just this vegetation fire that goes into wooey and wooey and vegetable. There's an intermixedness. And so the, the whole interface is not the best term but it is the federal terminology used, and so we'll keep using it. But the reality is, is that there's a mixedness. It's not completely urban, it's not completely vegetation. Most of these fires have a mix and an interplay between our built environment and the natural, even if it's modified, in the vegetation environment. These fires also are not restricted to one place. You know they're worldwide. I don't have any great worldwide maps. But within the United States, we have some great maps. This one from 2010. I'm um, colorblind, so it's a little hard for me to make out. But if you can see it clearly, there's really all over the country. In areas you don't think, like in the Northeast, would that have really? Well, yeah, of course it would. Uh, because there's vegetation next to structures. Are there really fires? Yes. They may have a couple structure damage. It must be much smaller in scale. There's a lot more fire resources. They're not as extreme fire weather, but there are risks as well. But there are hot spots throughout the country. This is a map uh, from 1999 to 2016 um, from the Forest Service, which shows the different um, <coughs> fires which have occurred and destroyed structures. I wish we kept having these maps updated. This is just a great way to look at all the hot spots around the country. California is clearly leading in the country, and by data it is in terms of structure losses, but there are many other hot spots um, in the Pacific Northwest, actually in the South, in the, the Southern United States. There's actually lots of fires and a great amount of work on uh, prescribed burning uh, throughout Texas and Oklahoma. There, there's a lot of areas of Rocky Mountains that all have their own fire regimes and their own fire risks and, and you know, behavior which occurs up and into communities. Why do we keep covering this? Because fire brands are central to how these fires get into communities. So we are seeing more and more. This is a growing problem, which is why interest in fire brands has been growing. It's not so much that there are more fires, as you see on the graph on the left, that blue, the number of fires may be level, maybe going down, but the area burned is going up. And because that area burned only happens from 3% or less of fires, it's a few fires get very large out of hand. And those very large fires are very hard to stop, control, or do anything with as they approach communities under extreme fire weather. 
And on the right, you can see in blue US losses, which I don't have a lot of great data, and California losses in terms of structures. Structures can be anywhere from an apartment, a single family home, a shed, but the structure losses are massive for a number of, a small number of California fires in particular, really drive up those numbers and result in deaths, as you see in the bottom right, as well as extreme losses in 2018 surpassing hurricane losses. And so, or at least at the same level, you can see just how devastating and how large of a problem this growing threat of wildfires are to communities. And it's not always the fire in the forest, as you see on the right. Sometimes in the left, it's in California. Now this is, you know, uh, surrounded by more vegetation area, but Middletown, you can see before and after that particular structure, you wouldn't think is just out in the forest, but had enough vegetation and was, you know, burned to the ground. Paradise was a situation where the community was surrounded completely by large conifers, and it was a really devastating fire. I'm not going to get into it here, but NIST and CAL FIRE have a thorough investigation you can go through, uh, and was really just a, a record-setting, uh, unfortunate uh, event. The Tubbs Fire in Coffee Park in Santa Rosa, California is a great example. Um, and we spent a lot of time looking at it. While there's not uh, any really detailed investigations, this fire jumped over highways in large areas. Clearly, embers played a role. They played a role in the campfire as well. But this was a suburban community. You would never think it was a wildfire risk area, but it burned through from a process, including firebrands as well as structure to structure spread. And just as a stark reminder that this isn't only a West Coast problem in the US, I mean, we know it's a, obviously a worldwide problem, but this is in Gatlinburg, Tennessee, next to National Forest. There was also a devastating fire with over 2,400 structures destroyed and over a half billion dollars of damage. And it's a chimney tops two fire. And there are after effects beyond just the structures burning. There's smoke, pollution, emissions. Uh, obviously, folks that uh, do not have the means to escape or to have HEPA filters and to have masks are going to be more adversely affected, those with ill health, those without financial resources. And after those fires in the bottom right, you can see landslides um, and mudslides that occur after the fact from the fuel being stripped. But our focus today is going to be more on how the fire gets into our community. And so obviously it could start from a community out and, uh, you know, 50 years ago, that may have been the focus of keeping your cabin from lighting the forest on fire. But our real thought process, and at least after 1985 was meetings between Forest Service and NFPA, we're really talking about protecting our structures from a potential wildland urban interface fire. And to do that, we have to think about why our communities are burning. And Coffee Park's a great example of this. How did the fire jump over a highway? How did it get here? And how did this whole community burn down? Well, I like to break this into three pathways, which is well known, um, of how fire spreads into a community or into a, a, a suburban area. First and foremost, we have radiation. And so radiation was originally thought to be responsible for most or all ignitions. You have a big fire, optically thick, and depending on how big the flames are, separation distance, radiation has got to ignite the side of the structure. Now, if we want to prevent that from happening, just remove the fire from the area. So push it back. And that's where the, the starting point of defensible space comes in. So it's not about clearing everything, but can you move any potential flammable materials back far enough so the radiation from the fire can't get to the structure? And that's where the start process for this goes. And for most fuels, that's 30 feet, some up to 100 feet. And it turns out that uh, these experiments in the most extreme situation, this is the International Crown Fire Modeling Experiments, and Jack Cohen ran a series of experiments here where they had these large crown fires and different target fuels. This is, you know, for instance, is like a, a wooden shed, and you can see that 40 meters, 130 feet away, they couldn't ignite this, even from the most intense fires. These are 200-foot flames. These are, it's very large. But it turns out that that's, that's not the only story here, right? Because we know that even if we have separation, 
we still get a lot of structure ignitions. But what we learned is if we clear the fuels away, it's very difficult to ignite from radiation. So there's at least one thing that we can do something about. You could change the materials, but most of all, you can move the fuels away from the structure or do some of the fuels to reduce things like pound fire behavior. But there are other ways fire can get in. One, direct flame contact. And so this is smaller flames from nearby sources, whether it be conduction or even near scale radiation or convection. But imagine a fire spreading through fuels, hitting your wooden fence and mulch, hitting the siding, but because that wooden fence and mulch is a fuel itself and it's only inches away, it's going to spread up the siding in the side of the house. Even if that siding is hard to ignite and wouldn't readily ignite with radiation, if you have a direct flame on it for five or 10 minutes, it's probably gonna melt away, expose OSB and other wooden boards underneath it, has that potential to ignite and burn. And so getting those fuel sources away from the structure is critical. There's been a lot of structure separation experiments and experiments with wooden fences and mulch near structures. And as you can see an example here, just keeping it five feet away from the home, there's a great deal to reduce any potential fire effects where it spreads because those flames can't ignite the material if you have some distance. But we've seen that even with distance, homes keep igniting. It jumps over roads, it jumps over freeways. And that's firebrands or embers. And so these are the small burning particles which cause spot ignitions. It could be a spot in the defensible space zone which spreads to the structure or on the structure itself, on a deck, in the roof, in a crevice. And so as these embers land, they ignite new fires. And how many embers are there? You'll see millions. They're everywhere. And so we'll talk about the generation of embers and what we're understanding, but maybe it's not as much about understanding exactly the number of embers, but just understanding how to prevent the ignition of the structure from these embers and where they might accumulate and how far they might go to land. So I'm going to talk in a minute about investigative reports, but uh, all these investigations have pretty much concluded with different fractions that most wooey uh, ignitions are due to small flying embers, not the main fire. And you can see examples of that here. See a house in San Diego where basically the, the fire spread in, inside, maybe through a vent or an opening to the attic, and it basically burned from the inside out. There's no way a fire from radiation or some other method caused that. And in the bottom right as well, you can see some spot fires starting and all over a, a roof igniting that structure. So let's show some examples. What do firebrands in the field look like? This is from the Joint Fire Science Program experiment done in the New Jersey Pine Barrens, looking at fuel treatment, but you can see it's small scale. Embers are large, they're not moving very far, but there's local scale spotting uh, of mostly flaming embers. This is an example of a uh, fire in California. You can see where there's a chopper coming in to do a water drop, taking up a huge number of embers. You can see embers in the top right flying across a road. This is a wind-driven fire event in California and on the bottom right approaching a home. The conclusion being that embers are a blizzard, a storm, a shower, and basically all over the place there are these smoldering particles and firefighters are pelted with them. You usually wear fire retardant clothing on the outside. It's not like they're gonna melt through very much, but they could make pock marks in cotton and other flammable materials, just like they could on a flammable part of a structure or in a yard and potentially accumulate and ignite material to flaming combustion. Let's take Australia as the extreme case. A lot of uh, eucalyptus species have stringy bark, which are just incredibly receptive to firebrand production. Talk about fire adaptive, uh, but this is just a clip found on YouTube and you can just see the most extreme sort of firebrand event. These are very large embers and they're not just landing and glowing, they're starting to transition. And you can see how basically if there are any receptive materials on the structure or surrounding, you're going to have a chance for ignition. If you have enough exposure, there's just going to be chances for ignition everywhere. Finally, I have a video from Fort McMurray, which shows the process. This is a fire which occurred in Canada and is a very scary evacuation occurring. Luckily, most people were all right, but you can see the fire as it progresses into the town. 
And uh, again, you know, video off YouTube, but it was really interesting to see, uh, we're gonna look in the back of this truck, oops. As uh, people evacuate, you can start to see the ember production as it's coming into town. So you can start to see some embers in the treetops. You have a pretty much a crowning fire starting on the side and you're starting to get the embers getting close to the structures. And as it moves through, you're gonna see that some of those embers actually successfully spawn into people's yards. You can see how it's ignited some vegetation and it doesn't take very much. This is not that massive um, you know, flux of embers, but there's a great separation between the structure and there. And you can see how there's already been a receptive fuel ignited and the wind, you're already getting some pretty high flames. And so there's a big factor here um, some of the embers you can see probably are flaming, most are smoldering, but if they find a receptive fuel, oh, look at that bush, and you get enough wind, there's a very good likelihood that that can spread into the house. Even though we've got a great separation between the trees, which are mostly burned out, so that main crown fire is probably going to burn out, but the fire you now see, you've got flames almost the height of the house, it's blowing towards the house, can shatter a window, window embers get inside, or ignite the siding or under the eaves of the house, you're going to have a total loss. And if that house is burning, that house can generate enough flames, potentially ignite its neighbors, and the process can continue. Firefighters are very busy saving lives and not necessarily getting to each structure. And structures, as we mentioned, are also potential sources of ember or firebrand production. You can see just how many firebrands can be generated from a structure here. Uh, they're everywhere. Uh, any vegetative material, any woody material can generate embers which can fly. OSB plywood, they're made from small particles. Uh, exactly how many and how it compares is still something that's being researched and studied, but you can see from many different structure fires that there are lots of ways for firebrands to be produced, with the, the most severe being cedar shake shingles on, woof, on roofs. Um, there's a lot of documented evidence to say that basically forms an airfoil, can transport the 1991 tunnel fire in Oakland, Berkeley Hills, just was completely devastating because those shingles were not only very easy to ignite, but when they flew off, they could fly long distances with a large uh, amount of burnable material and start new fires. So why, we've seen the videos, but why do we really know this? Well, there's been a lot of investigation documenting that firebrands or embers are very important. And so I'll mention some of the, the, the work that's been done. For instance, uh, Dr. Jack Cohen from the Forest Service, now retired, he led those international crown fire modeling experiments and also did a lot of fire investigations with his colleagues, including Grass Valley Fire in uh, Lake Arrowhead, California. And they saw from the documented evidence that even though these were mostly wooden cabins, you know, the vegetation surrounding a structure was not always burned. It could be completely intact, but this structure could be ignited and burned. And how does that happen? And that's really uh, started to document a lot of the evidence for firebrands being a major source of ignition. This obviously wasn't the first, but it was one of the most documented and Jack went on to be a big advocate in NFPA, which does FireWise and fire adapted communities um, and other groups to sort of promote the hardening of homes to reduce their ignitability defensible space and working on that front. NIST has led some of the most thorough investigations. Uh, you see bottom Alex Marangidi staring out at a burned out fire. The Witch and Guajito fire in San Diego was a great investigative work. Um, and I was in San Diego during that fire. Uh, and at that time, that was really, you know, one of the most documented cases for us to see the progression and actually look at what caused what. And then because they went through the fire records and investigated each structure, started to pick up the pieces and understand that. And then IBHS has been a relatively newer player to this. Steve Corals, who's retired from IBHS in Berkeley, has also done a lot of investigative work. And all these groups and many others, which aren't listed here, have done these investigations to show that embers and firebrands are so important to the fire spread process in the buoy. This is a photo now talking about those of the Grass Valley Fire. This is in Lake Arrowhead. I spent a lot of time there uh, as a kid. And you can see rows of destroyed homes and those adjacent unburned trees. And so sometimes the trees are burned out because maybe the tree ignited first, but probably the structure had so many flames it ignited the trees. 
uh, and this was next to a golf course. But you can see basically the progression and, and how something was happening here that wasn't just straight up, you know, continuous flame. In the Witch and Guajito wildland fires, you can also see it's a, a little hard to make out, but there's the ignition of a structure A, so in red, where the structure ignited from continuous fire spread is surrounded by chaparral fuels um, in Rancho Bernardo uh, near San Diego. But the blue area where there was burned vegetation uh, could have been a source, but also bottom and C, the screen, were a result of direct ignition by embers. So you have this whole mix, right? On the outside, uh, definitely this is igniting from the vegetation. Uh, then there could have been something close to the structure, but there were a lot of these that just, how could it have jumped? The only way is by embers. And so there's certainly a mix of sources. And in later fires, we see more and more potential for embers, either directly or indirectly igniting structures. And there's also other evidence you can see again, uh, maybe a better map of seeing, you know, which structures were destroyed and seeing some of these in the interior clearly had to have been from spotting. Um, but roofing materials are really key, right? Roofing is very susceptible if it's wooden to ignition from embers. Uh, and one of the key tables from this report by Marangides et al. Um, was looking at the destroyed homes and the typical comparison, oh, how many had wood shake roofs, but uh, point is that all exposed wood shake roofs that were exposed to the fire basically were destroyed, was only some fraction, 24% of Spanish tile roofs were destroyed. And as we learn, it's the small details. The Spanish tile roofs, there's a lot of nuance. If uh, all the areas are cemented in and closed off, that may actually fare better, but it depends on how it's built and how it's put together. I want to spend time now on some of the firebrand processes. So what are the processes that come together and actually help us understand firebrand behavior? And so we're going to talk about that here. Three main aspects that we like to, to come out, and this is from a, a review paper that we wrote together. Um, at first, the firebrands themselves must be generated. And typically the wind and the force breaking that vegetative material comes from the wind or from the wind generated from the fire from a buoyant plume or even from a fire roll. On uh, the firebrand generation often will see occurs not so much in the flaming mode, but in smoldering after the fact. Now this happens because we need some time for the wood to degrade, to pyrolyze or oxidize and then become less dense and more brittle. That makes it easier to break. And depending on the wood material and obviously the wind speed, different breakage patterns can occur. And we're still just starting to understand this process. But depending on that, we're gonna generate firebrands and we're gonna loft them. And so a lot of times in terms of lofting, there's this interconnection between transport and generation because the higher winds or larger fires are going to generate firebrands that can get high into the convective column and then be deposited through the atmospheric boundary layer and land much further downstream. So it really does depend on the fire strength and where those firebrands might land. Even though the generation is easier to study in just that small picture, we're interested in how far they're gonna go and what state they'll be when they land. Then in terms of transport, once you have that initial lofting height, we're concerned with the transport of those brands and they're burning. Could be flaming, that's probably short distance, for the most part, they're smoldering. We'll see a lot of times we assume that they're flying at their terminal velocity, but the drag force as well as the reaction rate during burning are important. If there's nothing left burning by the time it lands, it can't do anything. There's no energy left. But if it still has burnable material and can still be burning when it lands, we obviously see there is the potential for ignition of target fuel. So we're going to see that there are lots of different ways to model this transport in detail or, or in not so much detail, or just look at maximum distances. Then there's a the hard part about ignition. And does it ignite in the smoldering phase, the flaming phase, smoldering and then transitions to flaming, or just peters out and never ignites? And it depends on wind, it depends on the target fuel, depends on how many embers or how large they are and their energy state. And so all of these processes are important. 
Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about what we know now, what we, we already understand for each of these, and I'll, I'll highlight some of the open questions as we go. This is not like when I lecture about the stuff I did in my PhD thesis, where we had flame thread of materials and we can come up with a beam number and we can look. So there are models for the burning process and for some of the transport, but there's so many different ways to express it. And there's so many different simplifications and they have to gloss over so many aspects. Uh, I think it's better to review the broad scope of what we understand and talk about the different ways to approach it in each. And then you can look up these specific papers and look for a specific formulation if that's of interest. But I think we're still trying to just document and understand the right ways to model this. And most importantly, come up with some validation data to actually show that the way we're representing it is truthful and relevant to real scale problems. So let's start on firebrand production. By and large, the greatest amount of information we have of firebrand production is collection of the embers that fly off something that's burning. Uh, Sam Benzello and Sayaka Suzuki, uh, formerly from NIST and now uh, in Tokyo and at Reax Engineering, they have done many dozens of studies collecting embers, as well as many other groups, uh, groups from Edinburgh, uh, Albert Simeone, who I think is there, and Rory Haddon, and, and many others who have uh, done fires and collected brands. Oftentimes, the collection is done either in a laboratory or in the field with pans filled with water, something we've done as well. We worked with IDHS and collected them. Um, we've also seen places where we can collect fire brands with special instruments or with IR cameras. There's all sorts of ways people have tried. But for the most part, firebrand production has been a collection Right, so the water is there to extinguish it because otherwise it will keep burning. And then afterwards you take it, filter it, dry it, weigh it, take pictures and understand what is that proportion. The bottom right is an experiment in New Jersey Pine Barrens, which I thought was pretty cool. And I'm sorry that the citation doesn't seem to have um, popped up, but it's El Hosemi et al. Um, where they took a, a bush in the Pine Barrens and looked at it before and after the fire went through, and you can see there's the smaller twigs burned out, but the larger ones are remaining. And so depending on what you burn and the conditions you burn, bark versus trees, you can look at the different materials that come off. There are some issues, of course. Um, you can only collect so much in the pans. Some of it lies on the floor. Getting an overall picture is hard. So how does this look? So this is a piece of chaparral fuel and there's a bunch of pine needles up front and we're burning through. I'm not sure how the video is going to look, so I'm going to show pictures afterwards, but the fire burns through. And as the fire comes afterwards, you can start to see smoldering. This is very thin because it's chaparral, it's chemise. Uh, and those smoldering pieces are remaining until the fire has gone through. And you can see the glowing, that's solid phase oxidation or smoldering, but now they're all flying off. They become brittle enough and that there's enough force for them to to break and fly off as large pieces. And so some of those are gonna be collected downstream, some will burn out through the air. It's a hot mess downstream. There's no way for us to collect everything, but we can get some idea of the distribution and try to subtract what's there from the pine needles, which mostly burn out. But as you saw, some of the plant is still there. So this is what it looks like before. This was from a JFSP project done at IBHS. Uh, NC State was the, the PI on the project. See, the fire came through. Uh, it's basically burned through. And, and as the fire goes through, there's basically nothing lost material-wise. Then it's smoldering after the fire's gone. Then those pieces are glowing and flying away and becoming firebrands. And this, I think we see in many situations, is how the firebrand process actually proceeds. It doesn't necessarily proceed as some, um, you know, giant uh, fire is lopping everything. Well, a lot of times it's actually more so that we see the smoldering and flying off, at least in the experiments we've been able to perform. So there's been a lot of collection of size distributions to be measured by hand. It can be done by pictures. You'll see a lot about the uh, area. And so if you take a picture of the brand right on a piece of paper, you'll get the projected area. And the number of fire brands, most of them are on the smaller size. This is in the millimeter size, and the collections are very pushed in the distribution, uh, most are the smaller size. 
Can there be larger? Yes. Have whole logs been observed flying through the air in Alaska? We think so, but they're rare. Most firebrands are small. That's the vast majority. And, and our vast majority is really worrying about this huge shower of firebrands, not necessarily one fluke larger one. And again, you can see on the left, the mass distribution from different species, generally on the smaller end. What you're also seeing here is, is one of the most common ways is the mass versus surface area correlation. Because we take a picture of them, we can see the surface area in that sense, or like the picture of what's the area covered by that. Um, we can compare that to the mass. And so there's usually a linear correlation, so long as the sizes are all the same. If you have cylindrical mixed with flat, obviously there's going to be differences in the way you take a picture uh, from the overhead view. And there's, we did a review paper, this is now 2017, so it doesn't have a lot of more recent studies, but if you could just tell from that bottom graph, most of the generated firebrands are in the smaller size range, um, percentage-wise, 80% are very, very small. And so usually we are looking at smaller scale embers, which still contain some energy, but uh, are not that large to be you know, flaming and, and burning, except in the very local area. So can we go further than just collecting? Well, we can try. There's really only two breakoff models that I'm, I'm aware of. One is by Barr and uh, DK Ezekoy from UT Austin, where he looked at the sort of fractal geometry and looked at firebrand formation. Um, and, and basically, I think a good result is that they found when the material degrades down to some critical density, it starts to fracture and the fracture strength changes. Something that later is a, a postdoc and now um, faculty at San Jose State, Ali Tahiti, led a paper that we worked on. Um, so it's still not complete, but it's, it's published. Uh, I should put it up here in uh, Frontiers in Mechanical Engineering. We were able to come up with a, a, you know, a sort of joint thermomechanical model. But what we really found is that there is a correlation similar to what Barring Ezekoya has as the density of that uh, stick or branch starts to reduce we see that point where the fracture is actually possible. You've got stresses from the wind or from the point forces which are pushing on there and it has to degrade to a point where this happens. And it's complex. We've seen papers with charring, how there's cracks and all this. And so there's a complex material process, but ultimately it's happening all over this fractal geometry and things are slowly breaking off, at least in terms of sticks and branches, uh, it'll be different for bark and, and other areas. And there's been some similar studies um, done from Oregon State, uh, David Blanc and others, where obviously a huge fraction or a huge uh, dependence of the ability for something, you know, a wooden stick to fracture is related to its size and the velocity of the wind. Now we've done some of this work. We, we were struggling with this. Um, this is uh, Xiao Yu uh, Chu and um, Adi Hajalu. who are working together and doing experiments in a wind tunnel to look at firebrand yields. So one of the problems we have is that we don't collect all the firebrands from any experiment. Some of them don't land in the pan or get burned up and where they go. And so we created an experiment where we have a closed loop wind tunnel which dumps through a mesh into a water pan and extinguishes all brands immediately. And we can control the wind speed, we can control the ignition, we can control the burning. And we've done this with, in this case, Douglas fir, but also different fuels. How much of that branch, and you can see the diameter of the trunk. So it's initial five millimeter diameter. We've, we've done different diameters, different moisture contents. Um, but you can see for a certain wind speed and for certain conditions, you get firebrands produced anywhere between, you know, maybe five to uh, nine or 10% of the mass of that branch become those broken off flying embers. And then we can classify them. We have distributions and all that information. But I think some of this is important, right? How much of the actual tree becomes embers? Well, you can figure out how much is the trunk. That trunk is not really contributing to this. But of those branches, depending on the size distribution, we can estimate uh, the mass fraction of embers or firebrands produced and use that as an input into our codes and models of how many firebrands we want to log. And it is a factor of the diameter of those branches, as well as the velocity. 
but not so much the initial mass of fuel. We can take more or less and it doesn't seem to change, which is good to say that the scale of the experiments doesn't matter too much. And so we can also scale this and the scaling uh, without going into too much detail, but just between the wind and the breakage essentially results that this, this looks like a function of the diameter of the trunk and the velocity. And so for a trunk that's, or a, a branch that's facing the wind, we can then correlate this and see the mass fraction of firebrands versus this. And we have a, an empirical factor for the fuel moisture content added in, but this was a nice way to collapse the data and come up with a distribution. It only works for the specific experiments, but it's a starting point because we actually collected everything from the beginning to the end, which is hard to do as you go up in scale. So that's the generation, but we don't just care about if the firebrand's made. Well, some of it falls to the floor, how much of it lofts up, how far does it go? And that's lofting and transport. Uh, production and ignition, I think, are the least understood. Lofting and transport, there's a lot to still understand. However, there are a lot of models already. Um, Yunmo Ku, uh, there's, there's papers by Clemens, even Manzello, but uh, Ellis, Ochizi, uh, Albini, there's a lot of papers which have measured and modeled firebrand lofting and transport. And then they're used in CFD models and landscape scale fire models uh, all over the world. Um, there are aspects that are not well understood, but I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the basics of these models where you can find them um, and what we kind of know and don't know. So how far can the firebrand go? Well, in the US, like in 2007 in San Diego, Firebrands were observed to arrive an hour before the flame front arrived. And that was travel up to nine kilometers. That's really far. And that's way before the fire gets there. Will there be anyone? Also, ignition of properties occurred nine hours after the main fire front. Well, that's important because the fire crew may be gone and there may be a smoldering fire that later transitions. This uh, smoldering to flaming transition and that transition from the smoldering particles to something in the structure and then later to a flaming fire is really complex, hard to model and very important to this process. There are many models for transport um, and we're gonna talk about how they kind of incorporate burning and then aerodynamics uh, with one of the first being by Tarif et al in the 1960s. Um, and most, at least in the US, use formulations by uh, Frank Albini, who was with the Forest Service. And so you can see some of the papers cited here that we're gonna discuss today. So um, I wanna also add how far they can go. There's a nice paper in Australia um, by Story et al. Uh, Jason Sharples and some others contributed to this, but basically looked at what parameters are there that contribute to how far firebrands can go and start spot fires. This is for Australia particularly. Obviously, or maybe, you know, wind speed was important. Uh, steep slope being available somewhere, that's going to change some of the dynamics and some of the local fire conditions and the size of the fire area. So this can obviously change the plume. And if you have a large fire, which is generating a very large plume, you have the possibility to get those embers very high and transport them very far. Now, what they saw, again, most spot fires don't go very far. Right, you can see in the bottom left, the frequency of spot fires, most did a very small distance. But one went 14 kilometers. So, you know, spot fires have been documented in the US or North America up to 19 kilometers. Uh, 1965 in Eastern Victoria to 29 kilometers. Very unusual, but it happens in extreme fire behavior conditions. And the right, you can see the number of spot fires. Again, most of them occur closer to the fire front. And so this is, uh, this is from our review in fire technology, but uh, a summary of different models that are used. And I'll just note, you know, who has this, it was cited earlier as a great review article in IJWF, looking at all these models and just a great explanation of each type of, of lofting and transport model. So we're gonna talk about a few just to understand the basics. The most common is from you know, is basically models by Frank Albini because it goes the maximum distance a fire can spot and they're used and formulated then in far side and flame map to look at the distance 
and to generate spot fires. Um, Chandler had a really good succinct outline of the phenomena, and I just copied this from the paper. How does it work? Well, a firebrand of burning umber is lofted into a rising stream of flame and combustion gases, or rises in the convection column until it's ejected into the ambient wind field. And then it falls under the influence of gravity and moves laterally by the wind until it lands on a surface. If there's energy left, it lands and a spot fire results. Otherwise, it's dead on arrival. And this is basically how most of the models apply this, but the methods for generating it up, for transporting it, for tracking it, for transporting through the wind are all different depending on the model. So some of the parameters that are important is the initial fire intensity or heat release rate of the fire. That's gonna change the max lofting height. It's gonna change the wind profile. And a lot of times plume um, simplifications can be used to try to estimate the velocity field under which it might travel through. We also have to worry about the size and distribution. Smaller embers are gonna push higher but run out of energy quicker. Larger embers will carry more energy but may not go as high. And so for instance, in Farsight, usually a distribution is launched so that you can try to get that. And obviously ember size is gonna affect that lofting height and the burnout. And we don't often know the initial ember size, nor can we model all of it. So major simplifications have to be made. In the transport, we often look at like things like the terminal velocity. So what's the terminal velocity of that smoldering particle? What's its size? And how does it move through the wind and boundary layer? And then we have to look at the burning duration. We assume a terminal velocity is blowing over that ember, and then it's generating a boundary layer around it, and it's burning. Can you model it as a droplet with sort of a B-number formulation? Can you model it for different geometries or have a fully coupled uh, solid oxidation uh, model and, and try to see when is it going to burn up, how much energy is left? And depending on the energy left and the number falling, can you look at the ignition and spotting probability? it might land in pine needle beds that are dry and that's receptive or, or mulch. But landing on a roof might be hard, but if you have a pile of them and enough wind, that might be enough to pick up and ignite the material. And so it, it all then depends on so many different factors. So in Albini's model, and, and this is just two of them, so spotting distance from a wind-driven surface fire, like we have in California often with the Santa Ana winds, or from an isolated source, from a torching tree, from a line fire. There's a number of these reports and papers. Um, and then Morris in 1987, basically took the outcomes and sort of tabulated this so you could see, depending on the wind speed, what's the maximum spotting distance dependent on the fire line intensity. And it's Byram's fire line intensity, which is a function of the fraction of the fuel that can be burned um, and the rate of spread. And so you can see how that distance and how many miles it can travel uh, changes depending on the wind speed and the initial fire line intensity. And that's sort of the outcome of Albini's model, which in essence uses a simplified plume and then transport with wind and burn out to see what's the maximum distance that ember could travel. Uh, and, a, and, a, and the drawback, by the way, of this approach is that this is the maximum distance it can travel. It's not the probable distance most will travel. It doesn't give a distribution. It just how far could this go? And then you have to back everything else up. Now, I'm going a little backwards because Sanchez de Rifo was the very first to really do a nice model of a burning brand. Um, but he found some really information, particularly about the burning process. And a lot of what was done was the role of a force balance. So this was done in a wind tunnel, and these particles were burning and actually were able to measure the aerodynamic forces and the drag force and estimated that these particles are probably moving close to their terminal velocity as they transport and came up with a model for that. Also was able to take, and Tarifa looked at the density and the radius history of, of different particles as they were burning in wind and tried to estimate the you know, co combustion speed essentially. And this on the right is an excerpt of uh, Ku's review, which I mentioned in the journal Wildland Fire is a great review if you wanna look at transport models. It's really well written and I think explains the basic parameters and how these models work very well. Now there are other models which go beyond and use this burning rate, but then also use uh, better defined plumes and transport. And so papers by Ku, Pagni, Wachisi, and, and many others 
um, actually come up with some semi-physical formulations for firebrand transport. And they're very useful. Um, however, they're not all implemented in the same way. FireTech, which is a CFD model implemented by uh, Los Alamos National Lab, uses a more uh, physical or semi-physical approach uh, by Yumoku. And um, as I understand, does a fairly good job of modeling embers in that way. Um, but other approaches in our work uh, with Elm Fire, uh, with Lautenberger, it has not worked as well. And so that approach has gone to a more statistical approach, which I'll talk about uh, in a minute. And it's really hard because there's no really good validation data to compare different uh, ember generation models to real events. So I'll talk about an approach because this is the results of this is used in Elm Fire, which is another fire spread model which we've been using. And so this is results by Sardoy et al. Um, I did two really nice combustion and flame papers uh, doing CFD modeling of uh, embers from a particular burning fire um, and looked at their transport. Um, and there's some results I want to talk about. So they created a CFD distribution and you can see how the embers are transported and then land. This actually used coupled char oxidation as well as flames surrounding firebrands and looked at the states in which they could land. Now what's important in their second paper um, of ground level distribution of firebrands generated by line fires and this is a, a result that I think is interesting and one of the few ways to show this. Not all firebrands land far away from the fire. So you can see in the first mode, right, there are a significant or a small but significant fraction of firebrands that land close to the fire front. The earlier video you saw from the New Jersey Pine Barrens showed firebrands, many of which were more in a flaming mode, landing close to the fire. They may be larger, not very lofted high. Um, and, and those are the sort of short range distribution. And there's a question, does the short range firebrand distribution significantly um, influence what we're doing? Do we need to know that to model it? Or will the fire just spread through that area quicker than the spot fires could ignite? We don't completely know. We don't have great data for that. But the second mode where those embers are lofted into the plume and land far away, we know is very important because that's faster and further and in different directions necessarily than the main fire front and can and do secondary fires which are gonna spread the fire faster. And so most often we're looking at that second mode and we are ignoring the first mode, which may be important in some day to address, but is not something that we do at the moment. Now in that second mode, you'll notice it does have a very log normal distribution look and there are many other results. There's CFD study, which you can see. And so, um, so we now take a log normal distribution approach to modeling the distribution of the embers. Now this is very nice because in some cases we want to statistically model firebrand production as well as firebrand ignition and distribution. By having this distribution statistically as some log normal, you can then adjust the parameters to say that, well, there's gonna be more firebrands here, less here, and look at the distribution now. The far tail, the end of that distribution, will be those longest potential spots, but they're not very likely. And so when you run this probabilistically with a Monte Carlo or another approach over many simulations, this will be very good about picking up those rare events and adding that to the distribution in a, a more formulated way. Hard part? is the actual choice of those parameters is very empirical and there's little validation data to compare with. Unfortunately, in a, the tests that, that we've seen and none of this is published, um, it's been difficult to get uh, a more physical approach to match any of the observed data of fire spread and the distribution approach has been much more straightforward and a lot more similar to real fire behavior, which is why it's been used. Now, just going off Farsight, which uses Albini's model for the maximum spot distance, um, there's a large number of variations there, but um, I just want to note this paper, which was an interesting um, side note of ele evaluating the ability of Farsight to simulate wildfires by downslope winds. And so this is the sort of wind-driven events in California, which are pushing through, and this is on the coast. Obviously, there's a huge number of of parameters which change when you're recreating any fire. And fire reconstruction 
It should be its own lecture and event, and hopefully someone's talking about that. But as you can see, uh, any base runs where this is largely an ember or, or spot fire driven fire uh, don't go very well. And it's, it's going in the wrong direction. Uh, is this because of winds? Well, they remodeled the winds. But the spotting model is another area where this it's really hard to put the pieces together and to actually model this. And current models are, are not on the mark to be able to, to model these. How much is due to the, the weather modeling? How much is due to the embers? They probably all play a factor in different ways. But it's an interesting side note to say that there are a number of papers now showing that current models don't always pick up ember spotting and spread very well. And there are so many different parameters to change and we need to do better if we want to actually model those fires. The last point we want to talk about then after the modeling the fire is ignition of the fuel. It's not very well understood or characterized. It's a stochastic probabilistic process. And there's so many factors that come into it. So that firebrand, we've generated a bunch, they've transported, and now they've landed. Well, where did they land? How big were they? How much energy was left? What are the surrounding wind conditions? What's the geometry of the fuel? What type of fuel is the moisture content? There's a lot of potential parameters that come together. And ignition isn't straightforward. It, it doesn't mean that you get immediate direct flaming ignition of the fuel which could happen, maybe the close range firebrands, most of the time they're gonna land and it's gonna be smoldering. Is there a buildup of smoldering material that eventually leads to transition to flaming? Does it start to smolder the material or fester? Does it take nine hours? Um, does more and more firebrands accumulate in the spot? Uh, there's all sorts of different ways under which it can transition. Most data is available in the literature for wildland fuels. Only in the last five years has there been a lot on structural fuels, and even then, not too much. I think it's always going to be probabilistic. On the right, you can see a graph of the probability of ignition versus relative humidity. These were prescribed burns of spot fires as a function of relative humidity based on 99 prescribed fires across Oklahoma. And this is one of the main graphs used to look at spot fire probability. It's so a really limited fuel type, a really limited case. We're not controlling for wind. There's, there are so many other aspects uh, here. But you know, in Farsight, for instance, you can type in a, a, a percentage probability, and that's the probability embers will ignite. And so uh, ignition of fuels is probabilistic, and it's, it's going to be very difficult for us to understand how to model that properly. Now. If we are going to talk about the modeling process, we're going to have to start to talk about, you know, some of the physics that's occurring here. <clears throat> and when I started on this process, a lot of the question was, well, what is the process? You have a brand. Does the brand ignite? Does it transition to flaming and then ignite? Or is the brand acting as a pilot? Is there a smoldering front underneath? Uh, is there gas phase ignition from the new smoldering front? There's a lot of different processes which can occur. And we're just starting to get some of that information, like in the new IFSS, um, collaborating with uh, Dr. Stolyarov and Jack Kabir, who's a student at Maryland, of, of actually how this process works for different piles and different brands. I'm going to start off with a very simplified case that is mostly from work from uh, Fernandez Peo's group here at Berkeley and uh, previous students like um, James Urban, who's now at WPI. So, Steel particle ignition of cellulose is a most simplified case. So take different particles, heat them up to different uh, temperatures, kind of looks like spark ignition from a power line. And how does the process go? Well, <clears throat> some of it is very straightforward. The steel particle is, you know, lands and sort of smolders and bursts into flame, or does it bounce and a bunch of material flies in the air and then it starts igniting. So there can be different mechanisms over which that happens. They've done a lot of work and a lot of papers with a lot of different particles at different diameters and different sizes. And you can see on the bottom how they've sort of narrowed down different regions for flaming uh, and no ignition regions. So it's, it's smoldering, but it dies out. It never transitions. And there's sort of some in-between zone depending on the diameter of the material and the material type and the temperature, which is the energy content, looking at its probability of ignition. <clears throat> 
And even though they're meta particles, there's a lot of similarity to smoldering particles. And they use things like hotspot theory, uh, with Rory Hatton and, and others wrote that paper, um, borrowing from you know combustion ignition uh, to look at a minimum radius for ignition depending on the energy content. Now, obviously, metal particles are not the same as a smoldering particle, which is continuously reacting. And we're still not good, unfortunately, at modeling, well, as the wind speed picks up, how does the reaction rate of that particle pick up? That isn't well understood, or at least not well modeled. And so um, there's still a lot of gaps in actually modeling this process. But there is a paper like by Dodd et al. Um, that actually do model coupled CFD and, and solid phase um, oxidation and gaseous combustion to actually look at transition of ignition from smoldering to flaming. <clears throat> There's been larger experiments as well on ignition of fuels. You can see here, these are experiments by Manzello et al. in 2009, looking at the ignition of fuels with a, a few small firebrands on a crevice. Obviously, the crevice angle makes some changes, and I'll show some results later, which show uh, re-radiation between ignition boards is, is huge in terms of changing the probability of ignition. And these glowing brands which are landing are going to change. You know, so you have you have uh, convection, radiation, conduction, all occurring here, and we can probably have a lot of debate about which form and which factor is important, and I'll mention a little bit. But trying to get those embers and that heat distributed and to the right surfaces and re-radiating uh, is very important. And so the geometry here of this crevice plays a big role in actually getting this to ignite. A lot of experiments have been done on larger scale. You can see firebrand reproduction for testing here. The NIST Dragon, uh, which is usually done in Japan where there's a wind tunnel, uh, looks at the production of these embers on different components. So like whole sides of buildings, not the whole building itself, uh, and can really look at, well, what areas ignite. And so it's not the same as a very small scale lab where we measure heat, heat, heat transfer mode, but you can reproduce this and actually get, uh, oh, it goes under the eaves and it gets in there. And that's a great understanding. Then there's the large scale, and I'll show a video at the end, of an ember storm of firebrands produced by IBHS. Maybe not as well characterized brands, but you can look at an entire structure. What aspects ignite? How does it spread, depending on the materials? And so it's a really great, not just learning tool, but also investigative tool. <clears throat> and in our 2017 review paper on fire technology, we, we have a summary of studies. Obviously, some have happened since 2017, and I haven't added to the table on the slide, but here's some starting point if you ever need a literature review on ignition of fuel beds. So I want to talk about some of my own experiments because I, I think that this really demonstrated uh, some of the dominant parameters on ignition of fuels. And we've done studies through a couple of papers, both on artificial fuels. These are fluted wooden dowels, which are used like in Ikea furniture, as well as discs and cylinders, bark, uh, and manzanita and another um, twig. And so it's a little mini wind tunnel. And we have something similar to this uh, here at Berkeley. Um, this one's at Maryland still and still doing firebrand studies. Uh, but basically it has a nice flow and then you can look at ignition. A lot of times we started moving instead of ignition of a single particle trying to look at a, a pile. So what happens when you put a pile of embers on a fuel? Well, we tried a lot of work to measure heat flux. And I'll talk about two methods. One we've used is a water-cooled heat flux gauge, WCHFG. We know the gauge cools the fuels, so we ordered a special order to a small one. And that does pretty well. There's also the fact that you could take uh, an inert surface with an IR camera and look at its temperature change and inversely calculate it the heat flux. And uh, uh, Stolyarov and Jacques de Beer have done some work with that at Maryland. And there's a lot of work uh, who pioneered doing that um, by Brian Latimer's group at Virginia Tech. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. But we trust heat flux gauges and it gives pretty standard results. Believe me, we tried a lot of other methods to measure heat flux and ran into a lot of challenges. This gave very clear results, which matched with what we saw. So look at the heat flux over time. We have that in the inner, and you see this uh, TSCs, thin skin, thin skin calorimeters. They don't work so well with wind, but they at least give a nice temperature distribution. 
So what happens to the main heat flux, the heat flux gauge? Well, increase the wind speed, increasing levels of heat flux. This is 16 grams of embers. Obviously in a real fire, they're flying everywhere, but they're all deposited together. So this is an extreme case, but it's not necessarily too, too much of them. And over time, right, it's gonna peak at a high rate. But what's interesting is if you increase the wind speed, you're increasing the heat flux and increasing the burning rate. There's a limited amount of material to burn. It is solid phase oxidation, smoldering. Increase the wind speed, lower the duration of heating. So that's an interesting part. If you're just looking at critical heat flux, do you have enough time to ignite, right? There's a time to get it smoldering and then will it transition in time? And so there's an interesting caveat here. That it's not just about the critical heat flux, but then also the amount of time. And there's critical radiant heat fluxes for ignition of materials just as context. Wood can ignite in 12 to 14 kilowatts per meter squared. We can get 40 kilowatts per meter squared measured from a pile of tiny pile of firebrands. Firebrands can ignite flammable materials. But we've always studied single firebrands. Now, this is without wind. And without wind, we were able to approximate heat flux decently well using thin skin calorimeters. Not so well with wind because the approximations of cooling wind up being larger than what we're measuring. And it just doesn't work as well. It's possible, but with wind, it, it didn't work as well um, because the flow is just so complicated. But when we had a single firebrand, look at the distribution. Um, you know, three, four kilowatts per meter squared of the heat flux that's measured here. It's not very much. You can see that it's radiating around. It's not just where that brand is. There is heating that's going to sensors which are not touching the brand. But if you have a pile, we actually see quite a bit of heating. We can see maximum of something near 28 kilowatts per meter squared. I'm not so much at trusting the value, but look at the comparison. By having a pile of embers at the same condition, a lot more heat is transferred. Also leaves me to believe that there's a lot of re-radiation and sheltering happening and radiation is playing an important role, even those very short distances in the heating process to solid materials. So let's look what happens in a crevice. And so we did these experiments in a small crevice. Uh, we have those thin skin gauges as well, which kind of just give us like a temperature picture around, and then the heat flux gauge at the bottom. And we put it at the bottom because there's a lot of documented evidence that firebrands can land and sort of create that flaming right on that bottom um, where there's sort of a ledge and build up. And we loaded it with a lot of firebrands. So it was an extreme case. And we put it under wind. And you can see with different redwood or, or pressure treated wood how it progressed. Basically, everything burned in these cases. Some burned faster and, and smoldered longer and transitioned to flaming easier than others. But what was really interesting was the inert samples where we actually measured the heat flux. And depending on the angle with the wind, if it was flat with no crevice, we peaked at something like 20 kilowatts per meter squared for our loading condition. With a 30 degree angle to the crevice, we got like 40 degrees. So that's like at a side angle with the crevice. But when we had blowing directly through the crevice, and we could only do this up to 1.1, not to the 1.4 meters per second because we maxed out our gauge, we got over 70 kilowatts per meter squared. What is that telling us? It's telling us that we can get an incredible amount of heating depending on changes to geometry. They also see that it burned out faster than the other tests, but it's important to just look at how high the heating rate can be depending on geometry. And so the geometry and the way you're loading the fuel plays a huge role in potential ignition. Now I mentioned Latimer et al. And they had a really cool technique where they basically use a, a flat metal board and look at the bottom with an IR camera and do an inverse calculation to figure out the heat flux. And you can see up top there where they calculated the heat flux, something near 100 kilowatts per meter squared. Well, that's for an individual pixel. When you average it over the size of the fire brand, and you can see in the right in this table, you see reasonable values similar to what we've seen. 22 kilowatts per meter squared, 16, 19. These are reasonable heat fluxes, which are probably along the lines of what we've measured as well, and something that is very ignitable to wood samples. So even individual embers, if we're looking at the very local scale, is it enough area to ignite? That's a question. 
uh, can produce heat fluxes, at least locally, that are uh, capable of igniting materials. Now, before we end, I don't want to just talk about embers and talk about this and the physics of it, but where, where do we play a role? What do we actually do with this information applying to communities, applying to mitigation? How do we use it? So I'm going to talk about how we get a fire and vegetation into a community, and then it doesn't just ignite a structure, but it becomes a disaster. And then from that disaster, how do we um, stop it from progressing? How do we stop that disaster from happening? So let's talk about a disaster and what happens. Uh, this is adopted by a, a paper from Dave Kalkin and uh, Jack Cohen and others. So it starts with severe wildfire conditions, high winds, dry fuels, and we get extreme fire behavior, okay? High fire intensity and growth rates, which was almost always happening in one of these fires. And then we get residential fires. Many homes ignite. So we get multiple home ignitions and our fire protection resources are overwhelmed. I like to often say, right, if we can prevent most fires, we may actually have a fighting chance because the biggest problem is that our resources are overwhelmed. In the past studies by Marin Keatys et al, having a fire truck there in front of your house was one of the most effective methods of preventing ignition. But there's no way there's enough trucks for every single structure in an exposed community. And it's not necessarily safe. But if only a few are actually dining, there's a chance they can get there and do their job in safe conditions. But that's how we get a disaster. They're overwhelmed. They can't do their job. There's just too many places exposed. So we talk about ways to break this. First and foremost, reduce exposure. Don't have the ground fire next to your community. Change how the community is designed, fuel reduction, prescribed fires, reduce the exposure of the fire to the community. It also reduces embers. It doesn't stop when we know they can travel far, but let's push that tail further and further away. Then we can also harden, as we call it, structures. And hardening structures is protecting against direct flame contact, radiation, as well as embers. And a lot, I'll talk about our focus on embers. And so that's going to be your defensible space, codes and standards in the building, as well as community programs to keep your neighbors from igniting your homes. And then there's also the response component, notification, evacuation, and planning. We're not going to talk about that so much here, uh, but really a focus on the hardening. So let's talk about the components and systems. What actually ignites from those firebrands? You can see some vinyl gutters igniting. Uh, and mulch igniting, and the big question of whether the vinyl uh, gutters igniting is actually the best or worst thing as they fall down, but generally you don't want <laughs> flames being developed around your structure. So let's take a look at what this looks like. This is a video from IBHS, that uh, facility in South Carolina. Uh, you can download the Ember Storm video online. Uh, it's on YouTube here, but you can see the massive production of embers. I believe it's uh, wood chips as well as the fluted wooden dowels, which are used in there. They have this big array of fans and it's igniting a structure. And this structure is designed to ignite. You can see changes to the siding on the side. You can see there's already some fuel placed in those vinyl gutters. Um, and you can see how that's going and, and adding in there. Then you can see the shingle tiles are igniting. There was some fuel placed there. You're gonna see in a moment as well, that uh, not only this untreated shake roof is being vulnerable, but you can also see sightings in different areas as the flames go around. So there are certain components and areas of the structure which ignite. This uh, L-shaped inlet here almost creates a fire whirl sort of uh, recirculation, which extends the flames up and really ignites and moves into the building. And so different types of siding, breaking through windows, things falling off. There's lots of ways this fire can penetrate. And that building is turning in the wind so that they can demonstrate different materials on that structure and how they move in. Um, you'll also see inside the attic here and see with, depending on the mesh size, uh, some of those embers can get inside. And that's really bad news when you have the embers inside. You wanna make it smaller and smaller and smaller so that any embers that land inside can't actually ignite the materials in there. So what are the strategies for mitigation? Well, buildings are passively engineered 
I'm sorry, they're engineered to passively protect people from the inside. Sprinklers, fire rated walls, smoke detectors, not a lot from the outside. And so now we have to think about sealing the structure from outside fire influence so that the small fires can't ignite it and so that embers can't get in and ignite the flammable material inside. Large flames have to be pretty close to ignite the structures uh, unless they're in the home ignition zone. And so, you know, really we're focused on hardening and sort of sealing off the home so that the embers can't get in and the exterior materials can't ignite. So there's some key areas which have been highlighted. Um, mulch or any flammable material near the home, decks, fences, if they're flammable near the home and if they accumulate other flammable goods, they have a strong probability they can ignite a structure. Areas on roofs, things like dormers, uh, valleys, those are all areas where fuels can accumulate and embers can accumulate and then uh, increase. As we just saw, those different crevices can create a lot more heat before ignition. Eaves are huge. That's the area under the roof. Some of these are open. They have to have vents for mold prevention and circulation and, and structures, but you need to make those vents small. Right? You need to make it so that the air goes through, but embers can't go in. And there's all sorts of technologies, but mostly it's about having very small meshes that prevent embers from getting through that are large enough to ignite anything. And then things like gutters, which catch the vents, uh, windows, siding, all these materials which can be hardened to prevent ignition. So in roofing, there's been a lot of tests. Some Class A roofs can ignite. Uh, we say class A because it's basically the highest rating from some standard ASTM tests, but um, generally it's really hard to ignite a class A roof and most of the tests were where some of it was already degraded. And so they do a pretty good job of resisting ignition. It's not impossible, uh, but they do a good job. Gutters, um, it's still kind of hard to test and standardize. Um, metal gutters, if they accumulate, could hold that and could have a fire. Vinyl gutters fall down but they quickly reach flaming, so that's probably bad too. Um, and so how we do that in keeping those gutters clear, that all that area clear of fuel. If you live under a pine tree, this is gonna be really hard because needles are gonna accumulate constantly. So mulch and debris, anything within five feet and on the structure is a problem. Uh, there's no standard for ignition of mulch. There's gonna be some new tests done this later this year in uh, Marin County in California, which would be really interesting. But for the most part, you know, anything ignitable and flammable, keep away from the house. Eaves and vents, there is an ember test, I think a lot by Menzello and NIST's work, uh, ASTM E2886 uh, for mesh size. Um, it can still penetrate the small mesh, but it's really not very likely to ignite. It's sort of a drop test where it ignites some cotton down there. And fences, uh, there's a lot of research now at NIST, it's been published, move the fences away from the structure. Decks, porches, and patio, same thing, but I think there's still, uh, even though we've seen a lot of ignition just from accumulated debris and they've got lots of crevices, there's still no real good national test for brands. Uh, the tests really focus on flaming. And siding, windows, and glazing, there's a lot of uh, information, for instance, recommending double pane. However, if you have a plastic or vinyl structure that's holding that window and that uh, melts and burns out, uh, your whole window frame can fall out. And so it's always not just about a single material, but about the whole component and how it's built together. How does the roof connect to the siding? How does the window connect? Because if any part of that component fails, embers will penetrate and burn down the structure. And so you can see some examples uh, here. Um, with siding, windows, and glazing. Uh, windows can shatter under high enough radiant heat flux. It has happened. Double glazed windows help. Uh, I mentioned, depending on what the frame is made of, can also play a big difference. Um, you can see embers penetrating some siding materials here in the plastic. Also, they accumulate. These L-shaped corners are not good. It creates an area where wind, almost like those leaves blowing around and circulating, accumulates. And some highlights from some of these IDH te IDHS tests, uh, where you can see reentrant corners, um, valleys, and gable vents where embers can accumulate 
And you can see in some of these tests where any debris like pine needles here can then easily ignite from embers and start spreading the fire to the structure. So what do we want to do? Well, we want to combine our zone concept and defensible space, keeping materials away, and then hardening the structure. And by doing that together, we can really reduce the probability of ignition. And the more we understand about ember and its potential to ignite materials, we can try to create that area around the home to make it really not easily ignitable. Uh, and we do see evidence that defensible space has been effective. Uh, NIST investigation of the Wish and Guajito fire showed that having proper defensible space was very effective. We don't see all the same information from GIS inspections of past data, but we haven't really gotten great on the ground um, data from that. Of course, this investigation was very close and able to actually see that. Now, uh, I'm not going to talk about fuel treatments, but I do want to talk about a lot of times folks say, well, let's skip protecting the structure and making it harder. Let's just cover it. Let's just wet it. And sure enough, sprinklers, gel, foam agents, exterior blankets dropped by helicopters are all things that have been mentioned and people tried and most are not evaluated in an actual WUI event. Some sprinklers and other coatings have been, and actually it's pretty mixed. Sometimes sprinklers have worked, sometimes they haven't. We've done reviews, NFPA has a short paper with IBHS on it too. Um, most of the, of the results are, are mixed. Uh, ultimately, if you want to put water or gels or anything on a structure, yes, if they're at the right time in the right place, it is going to have a benefit for the short term. Can't blow off. It has to stay there. It has to be wet at the right time. But do you get it at the right time? How do you turn it on? Will the water be available? Will the electricity be available? And there's all sorts of tech solutions to get around it, but it's hard. Now, we do see folks like the Department of uh, Interior, National Park Service using it like to protect um, historical buildings. And that works great. You've got a fire crew who's right there. They did all the work to defend that area. They wrapped it. Then they put sprinklers. They did all this and it's maintained. And yeah, if you do that on an important property, you probably have a good chance of increasing survivability. But how do you actually get that for every home, especially when these are no notice events? Most structures burn down with very little notice and folks need to evacuate. You can't get everyone out in time and there aren't extra resources available. And so for a lot of these major events where there's lots of structures destroyed, not just a couple, um, this is very hard to implement. So overall, let's keep learning about firebrands and embers to reduce the risk of home loss. If we reduce the susceptibility of homes to losses, you know, ignition zone management and hardening the home, we're going to do a lot to actually prevent ignition. Now, there's also other work to do in the forest and the land surrounding, but I think some of the, and, and I agree with Jack Cohen and the major premise here that we want to focus on those structures and the structures surrounding structures to try to make them more ignition resistant. And that's going to reduce our losses from these fires the most in terms of community destruction. We still need to work on the landscape, do changes to our forest, but if we're interested in saving communities, that's probably where we have the biggest bang for our buck. Last but not least, most of the data we talk about here is about for a single home ignition zone, a single home, but your neighbor's home also plays a big role. That fire will affect your structure as well. And so we have to take a community approach whenever we do this. And there's no great resources other than everyone should be protected in following this. But it's going to be a real mixed effort. And I hopefully the more knowledge we have of firebrands and embers, that's going to combine to make this process cheaper and easier. So that's what I have today on firebrands and embers. I thank you very much for your attention and uh, if you have questions, please feel free to email me. It's mgolner, G-O-L-L-N-E-R at berkeley.edu. Uh, happy to answer questions and enjoy the rest of this summer school.